you pay attention to the great big wall of text on the screen. So go ahead, put everything up, don't look at any other software, because now you guys get to learn part of the process of being a security engineer within a company is knowing what to look for, right? It does you no good to think the hackers are among us if you don't know what to look for. And the hackers are among you. That's the fun part, right? But you have to learn how to hunt them down. So two primary tools hackers use are a web-based scanner and an operating system scanner. So there's two of them. You're actually gonna be to play with both of them. The one we're gonna play around with today is something called NetSparker. Right, so in your 166 directory, you should see a program folder file, that, and inside of that, you should see a program called NetSparker. All right. So NetSparker is only a web server scanner, right? Because systems have gotten to be so complex, they they've broken out scanning into not an all-in-one tool, right? And your book has got a lot of different kinds of scanners in them, and we're going to be playing around with a couple of them. Right? We'll be playing around with NetSparker for web services. And we have two web servers up here. What are the IP addresses of those? Anybody remember what the web servers are? 10 and 11. All right. One will have a subdirectory called WP, and the other one will have a subdirectory called Drupal. So that's where you can find the vulnerable web services. Now, what will get pushed out when you start doing this, and we're just taking the logs off the Drupal server, is that when you scan a web server, you're literally making a call for every single page on that web server. So you leave behind a monster footprint, all right? So if you go and you aim this at someone other than the two victim machines over here, you are leaving behind a monster footprint with Highline's IP address on it, right? And when you leave behind something with the IP address of Highline Community College, they'll call up the college and say, hey, what's up? And when someone calls and says, hey, what's up? Someone then turns around and gets hold of network services. And then network services freaks out and goes, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. And then when network services is done freaking out, they go, oh, we need to go talk to Dan. <laughs> right? This is going to immediately fall on me. Which means I sing like a canary, I squeal like a pig, and I song and dance. Right? So... Do not, under any circumstances, aim this tool at any other computer system other than those two victim computers on 10 and 11, all right? Because if you do, don't have Dan have IT call down his butt again, okay? <laughs> really, honestly. So you leave a lot of things behind. One of the things that NetSparker does is it tries to do with something called a cross-site scripting. And this is a pretty classic cross-site scripting. And when you're cross-site scripting, what you're trying to get the computer to do is do something it wasn't designed to do by giving it a bunch of stuff that it's not going to understand. Now, I know you guys aren't HTML coders, right? I know you guys don't understand a lot, but cross-site scripting is one of the most popular vulnerabilities on the face of the planet right now. So what ends up happening, right, is that when you make a script, when you do something, you want to have an open and close tag, all right? So when you have this, this is your open tag and this is your closed tag, right? And then whatever's in here is whatever will run. So it's considered a script. To cross-site script this thing, what we do is we open up that line with a couple of unterminated things. So this is good form. This is bad form. This will confuse the computer, right? because it doesn't follow proper syntax in URLs. It doesn't follow any kind of proper syntax at all. So the computer will go, oh, wait, there's a close of a style tag. Well, wait, where's the open for the style tag? And it will be looking through everything, trying to find that open, and when it can't find it, it goes, oh, wait, close script, where's the open script? And then the computer gets even more confused, right? And then it may just go, oh, well, fine, here. Here's everything, right? So you can confuse computers. Computers are getting better, programmers are getting better, but this is still way honking common, right? I can't tell you how many times that we've gotten into other people's web servers because of just this little two thingy right here, style and script, right? So these two are absolutely devastating to getting into a computer system, and it's that easy, right? And when you go into 10 and 11, both of these are vulnerable to various forms of cross-site scripting, right? So kind of neat, 
right? The other thing that ends up happening too is sometimes you'll see it encoded in what's called hex, right? So percent zero D, there's a really good out here at W3 schools, URL encodes, right? A URL encode is that there's a human readable line here, a space is percent 20. If you see percent 20, the computer is gonna understand that. You won't, unless you have this memorized. And this table goes on for like 254 characters. I don't expect anyone to memorize it today. Maybe tomorrow, not today, <laughs> right? But if you're running an application that doesn't require a lot of URL encoding, right, in general, and you start seeing a whole bunch of stuff like this inside your URLs, that immediately tells you there's something going wrong here or there's something odd, someone's doing something kind of fishy, right? And fishy behavior is where the job gets to be fun. Now you gotta go hunt them down, right? And hunting people down can be a lot of fun, right? So whenever you're doing stuff, you're actually gonna be looking at the Apache web server logs, which is what we've got. And you'll actually get the Apache web server logs off of those two computers later on. This is from last term, right? But these are the kind of things that you leave behind. So it's looking for vulnerabilities, it's looking for, it's leaving behind what tool it used, <coughs> all right? One of the things about com tools is that they leave their own fingerprints behind. So if someone's going through and using NetSparker against your website and you haven't specifically authorized them, at least you know what tool they were using, right? And that's a good thing because then you can go back and try to and run that same tool against your own website to see what maybe they got, right? So that's why a lot of the commercial grade tools always leave footprints behind in terms of what software tool was actually used so that you can just go grab the tool and then go see what they've got. Yes, sir. Is there a way not to leave a fingerprint? Yes, there are. When you start making your own tools, if you go into programming and you start making your own tools, there's ways of suppressing things in the system so it looks like it's normal traffic, right? So there's actually a specific scanning tool that will go out and look at Amazon Web Services looking for read, write, open shares in the cloud, right? So that you can upload your really bad Israeli country and Western music and then share it out with everybody on the whole planet or use it as your seed farm for a BitTorrent server. So there's specific tools. You'll see some activity, but you won't know it hit your server until you start seeing a whole bunch of bad country music on your Amazon server cloud, all right? So there are tools that will suppress it, Huh? Yeah, we were running an FTP server once and it got overran by about 100 gigs of really bad Israeli country and Western music. And there's nothing wrong with country and Western music, but the Israeli accent trying to sing cowboy. Yeah, and this was before the days of autotune. I'm just letting you know that this was long before the days of autotune, right? So when it's going through and it's doing its job, it's looking for a bunch of stuff. When you see air codes, right? 404 is the best air code to see when someone's scanning. And the reason why 404 is the best air code because the computer is then telling the person that's doing the scanning, not found. I can't process this because I don't have it, right? So 404, absolutely good air code to have when you're seeing this. A really bad air code to see when you're actually seeing something is the code 200, because that means, oh, okay, here you go, we're good. So you'll notice that on air code 200, it was saying, oh, okay, here you go, for all the cross-site scripting. So now we know that somewhere in that Drupal site, there's some seriously cool cross-site scripting that we can do here with this, right? We now know that there's a vulnerability because the web server said, here you go, it's all yours. Go have fun. Go play. Right? So when you're actually looking through the logs, if you see error code 200, that means the web server said, okay, here you go. Right? If you see 404, that means not found. If you see anything in the 300, that means it was a redirect. Right? So if you move from one domain to another domain and you just want to update everything that's coming in off of Google or some other search engine, you'll send Google or Bing or Yahoo a 302 redirect to another site, which is okay if you did that. It's really bad when your web server is saying, I am dan.com and I'm gonna redirect 302 over to evil.com, 
That means something happened in the chain, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, somewhere in DNS, Dan became equated with evil. And we never want Dan to become equated with evil, right? Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. We don't want Dan to be evil, right? So knowing your HTTP error codes is a good thing, right? Knowing where to go find Unicode and URL encoding is also another really good thing to know, right? If, if you move forward in this career, it's an amazingly good thing to know. Another thing that's good to know is what do the extensions mean, right? So an INC file is an include file. Include files are interesting because they contain a lot of the backend server logic for that, right? So you have a normal PHP page that does things or a normal HTML page that does things. When you include something, when you make an include file that says, do this, but pull in all this stuff over here. And if I can get you to pull in my page over here on evil.com, then even better, right? A back file is a backup file. Backup files are fun. You've already gone and looking for backup files to go pull down someone's entire website, right, through Google. Backup files are awesome. Old files. Old files are also awesome because <coughs> you can compare the new file against the old file and see what they changed, right? So old files on a web server are kind of bad, but from a hacker's viewpoint, old files are awesome because I can take a look at the new file and the old file, and I can see what they changed, right? And if I can see where they changed, I can start figuring out how they code and how they program. And if they're sloppy, and if it's Friday morning or Friday afternoon or Monday morning, all right? This is another cross-site scripting, but what they've done is in these, instead of these little tags here, what they've done is they've encoded them percent Three's Charlie, right? So you'll see all this kind of behavior when you're going through your logs. And I mean, it's just amazing how much of a footprint you'll leave behind when you're running the tool, right? So I want you to be really aware of this. Where do we run the tool against? Victim machines, not Google. Victim machines, Drupal. So, okay, I thought you said Google there for a minute. I was gonna say, no, <laughs> no. All right, the other thing you'll do too is uh, in your Windows logs, you'll actually leave a bunch of really interesting footprints behind as well, right? So this is a Windows log. Everybody know how to get to your event logs in Windows, right? From 160, 161, 150, right? So you'll kind of see it. Parallel port driver service followed to the following error. Well, you know, we don't have anything plugged into the parallel port. So why would somebody be going after the parallel port, right? All, everything that's hooked to a computer is actually kind of a lot of fun to go play with. And just because it's not actually plugged into a network doesn't mean I can't try to overwrite the driver or the system volume for that particular program or application or even at the hardware abstraction layer or anywhere else in the computer system, all right? So if you see a bunch of errors starting to come across when you guys move up to your operating system scanner, Right? And you see people trying to pull things that you may not necessarily have actually plugged in. That's a sign that someone's doing something they shouldn't do. Right? When your security logs and you start seeing all sorts of policy changes and logins and logs offs for people you don't know and you start seeing a whole bunch of account management and you know that nothing's going on, and how do you know? You gotta actually go talk to people. You can't just sit in a cubicle. You actually gotta go talk to people. If you see a bunch of account management going on and you see a bunch of really interesting things built in for the new domain, right? This can kind of tell you that there's some kind of interesting things going on, especially if it's an anonymous login and it was successful across your network. Anonymous logins are horrible. The two times you used to see an anonymous login is in the morning, if you're a DHCP network, they have to authenticate to the network somehow, right? When they turn on the computer, that computer is gonna go ahead and authenticate to the network using a ticket. It's kind of an anonymous login, all right? And then at night when everybody shuts down. So you should see those two spikes. If you see one at two o'clock in the morning, start questioning things. Question a lot. Don't ever stop questioning, all right? If you're going through and you're seeing services that are kind of blowing out, Time cannot be found when you see these warnings, right? You can install or repair the component on the local computer. If it's corrupted, the installation is corrupted. All right, 
I want you to remember one thing about Windows. It works on a threading model. So when you're actually running a process and you fire off a process, it starts a number of threads to manage it, right? When you're in Unix, it runs the parent-child process. You have a parent Apache, and then you have a bunch of little children. And those children then go off and take care of everything that they need to go take care of. Threads are essentially the same way, but you can actually pop a thread, just like you can pop a parent-child relationship. And the minute you pop a thread or a parent or child relationship, you're in memory. You're actually doing things in the memory of that computer. So when you see something that the installation is corrupted, you can install or repair the component, that means someone went through and tried to get that thread to break and then go play around in memory and execute the program I wanted to execute, not necessarily the one that you wanted me to execute. Right? So if a lot of your programs are starting to come up with that corrupted, reinstall, that's a big trigger that someone's actually either being successful getting in or they're really hammering your computer systems hard right, to try to get in because you don't want your threads and windows to get broken open because then I can play around in that memory space and do horrible things. Right? The other really, really fun one is if it shows up as an error in the user environment. Right? The user environment is the one that most people are going to play around with. When you guys get to Metasploit, you're actually going to be going in as network or as system, as a network and system level process. But there's a mode to boost you up to the user environment so you can actually start doing things in the context of a user. If you're a user, right, the description for source cannot be found. Either the component that raises the event is not installed or the installation is corrupted. That means someone elevated their permissions in the system. Nine times out of ten, that's exactly what that means, unless it's a completely blown Windows installation and it's just broken all sides from somewhere. This is either someone being successful or trying to elevate their permissions in the system. So that's why your logs are so important. And one of the reasons why I didn't want you to plug your own gear into this classroom, right? Because you'll start seeing these things on your computer because there's nothing more fun than breaking into your friend's computer, right? <sighs> so your logs, and you're gonna get these logs to digest in week 10 because you have to do a whole bunch of security reports. I've recorded this. So you guys can actually go back and take a look. So you remember what to look for. So it kind of makes sense? Kind of good? Any questions? Everybody with me? All right.